Hi, my name is Derek Fear, and I directed the video you're about to see for my 2013 Eagle Scout project. We're going to take a look at six different pieces of Westford's history. This video is meant to be an entertaining and informative way to get a glimpse into Westford's past. So, here we go. Often considered one of the greatest writers of dark romanticism, Edgar Allan Poe captivated people's minds with tales of gothic horror and mystery. He was a master of the short story and also of poetry. Some of his most famous works include The Raven and The Telltale Heart. But despite his fame as a writer, most people don't know that Poe has a history in Westford as well. The history of this um, residence, 11 Graniteville Road, is that it was occupied back in the um, early, mid-1800s by the um, Richmond family. And uh, Mrs. Charles Richmond was also known as Nancy Haywood, um, whom uh, Edgar Allan Poe referred to in his poems as Annie. So you had Nancy Haywood living here um, and Edgar Allan Poe visiting here uh, to visit her back in the summer of 1848, where he died soon thereafter. The story goes that while visiting friends in Lowell, Massachusetts, Poe was introduced to Nancy Haywood, the oldest daughter of the Haywood family. The Haywood family and the Richard, Richmond family were actually bigger families in town. They had multiple residences around the town. The group that introduced them from Lowell um, actually felt that the Haywoods and the Richmonds were sophisticated enough to, for him to meet them. Unfortunately for Poe, Nancy was already married to Charles Richmond. Nevertheless, Poe was obsessed with Nancy Haywood. It is believed that his poem, For Annie, was written about Nancy Haywood, with Annie being Poe's nickname for her. Poe writes, But my heart it is brighter than all of the many stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie. It glows with the light of the love of my Annie with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. Nancy was also a musician and a music teacher in Westford. According to Robert Oliphant in his book, The Westford Gazetteer, Poe also gave readings at the Haywood Reading Circle and enjoyed exploring Westford. He visited Westford several times in 1848 and 1849. And uh, he loved the area. He loved Prospect Hill. And then again, he had his infatuation with Nancy Haywood or Mrs. Charles Richmond at the time, so who lived at this house. So between this house and maybe Lowell, maybe a few other spots in between, they're not quite sure. Um, but uh, that's where, you know, when he was out here, that's where they, where they say he stayed. Sadly, Poe died shortly after, in October of 1849, at the age of 40. The house was built in the 1700s by Thomas Blodgett, and the Haywood family lived here for many years. The main part of the house burned down in 1900, but the shed and barn were left standing, and were converted into the current home. A granite marker in the front yard commemorates Poe's visit to Westford. The Westford Town Common is located in the center of Westford and was bought in 1744 as a training field.
One of the unique features of the town common is a military cannon at the tip of the triangular green. Well, my name is Ellen Hardy and I moved to Westford with my husband in 1967, so this is our 46th spring here. And uh, I think I got interested in Westford history. I've always loved history, but Westford history specifically. In the late 1970s, I was and am a member of the Westford League of Women Voters. And we decided to do a history of the town of Westford as a slide tape show. And uh, sort of by default, I, had, I ended up writing the script for that. And in the process of doing that and getting in touch with Westford residents to find old photographs of Westford, I got very quickly smitten with the history of this town. So that's what brought me to Westford history. Well, there's a wonderful story about the canon. Um, in, in 1898, the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, whose name was Sherman D. Fletcher, a good old Westford name, uh, got in touch with the man who was the Secretary of the Navy. And he was a gentleman by the name of John D. Long, who had been the preceptor or principal at Westford Academy. And uh, Sherman Fletcher said, are there any leftovers from the Spanish-American War that the town of Westford perhaps could have? And they found that cannon in storage somewhere in Washington, D.C., which had been in uh, uh, Santiago, Cuba. Uh, so it was one of the ports that the United States um, was fighting in during the Spanish-American War. And it was loaned to the people of Westford um, as an example, uh, so that it would be the, the, an example of why there should be no more wars. It didn't quite work. But anyway, there it sits. Uh, the cannonballs also came at the same time, and if you are perceptive, you will notice that the cannonballs do not go with the cannon. Uh, that was so that there would be no one who would try to fire the cannon, and the letter from Washington said specifically that if it was ever fired, the, the U.S. government was not in any way responsible for any damage that was done. So it was placed there. It came by train from Washington, D.C., and was put right on that, uh, that point of the Westford Common. And uh, one of the things that they would do on Halloween night, I shan't tell you the others because I don't want to give you any good ideas, um, is that they would take all the cannonballs and they would roll them down Main Street and someone would have to find them in the morning. So uh, that was ended when the uh, street highway department decided that they would weld them together. So that tradition came to an end. The last person that I knew of who admitted to doing that uh, was Gordon Seavey. And Gordon was born in Westford in the first decade of the 1900s. There were a hundred, and we're not sure where they all went. Um, the Rodenbush Community Center was built at about the same time. It was the second Westford Academy. It was built as Westford Academy, and that was in 1897. And if you look at old photographs of the Rodenbush built when it was brand spanky new, there are little triangles of uh, cannonballs all the way around the circular driveway. So there were probably about seven in a pile. So that seemed to consume some of them. Um, when I was involved with the Rodenbush, we uh, took a metal detector and we dug around a lot to see if perhaps they had simply been buried under the lawn, but we have never unearthed the others. So the only ones that still remain are the piles that are, uh, are on the common. Westford is home to many historic houses. One of these houses is a Samuel Fitch House, located on Powers Road. At over 300 years old, the house has a rich history and is an excellent window into the daily life of Westford's early inhabitants. My name is Lynn Smithwood and we are at the Samuel Fitch House in Westford, Mass. The house was built in 1711. It still has um, a lot of the original features. It has the five original fireplaces, it has the indoor smoke room, it has the original white pine floors, open beam ceilings, which is unusual for a house of 300 years old. It was my childhood home. There were five other families um, in the home, which is again unusual to have a 300 year old house with only six families living in it. We opened it as a bed and breakfast because it has a lot of history and we we're having a lot of fun with people from all over the world. The Fitch House was built in 1711 by Walter Powers. He was a minister from the town of Chelmsford. He built a five room house. 
He lived here until 1732, at which time the Fitches bought the house. They lived here for almost a hundred years. They called it the Fitch House, and that's the name that was kept. This was the dining room. I like to start in this room because it has a lot of history. It was used by the Fitches during the Revolutionary War. Um, Samuel Fitch's son-in-law, Francis Layton, who is buried here in Westford, he was um, the committee man for the town of Westford. So during the, civil, during the Revolutionary War, um, each town picked a committee man. And for Westford, they chose Francis Layton. So he used this room as a tavern, and he got the committee men from Acton and Littleton and the neighboring towns to get together and talk about how they were going to march into Concord. The other thing that's interesting about this room is that, um, it, it, like all the rooms, the original rooms, each room has a fireplace that was their sole source of heat. They had no electricity. Um, but what's nice about this room is called the Parsons Cabinet. Again, the legend is that they built this little cabinet in order to hide babies during attacks. The historians that have come to the house say, no, 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 that's not where they would have put the babies. That's where they would have put the liquor for the parson. And it's very small and it probably didn't hold babies. The house is a center chimney, salt box colonial. So each room has a fireplace, there's one chimney up the middle. When Mr. Powers built the house, he built an indoor smoke room. Now a smoke room is where they would hang their chickens and their pigs and they would smoke them. So what he would do is he would cover the top of the chimney and the smoke would come down into this room. So with a smoke room that was built by the Powers was a luxury. Back in the 1700s, smoke rooms were out by the outhouse. So when people went out to the outhouse, they would fill it with wood and that's where they would smoke their meat. So this was a luxury for his wife. I think it probably was very messy. This is a door that was put on probably by the Murphys. Now the Murphys were the third family, lived here mid 1800s. You can see that it has the original blown glass. Um, and you can see where they cut off the glass. Now, when the house was built, the front of the house from outside, you see there's just a plain panel door, which would have been the kind of door they had in the, in the 1700s. This door would have gone in mid-1800s. Mid um, a lot of homes from that era would catch on fire because if the house was situated in such a way that the sun got into the little spirals of the glass, it would cause a fire in the house. This was the parlor. And the parlor was used uh, during the 1700s. Um, the parlor was used when the parson came to visit, but this room was used rarely. So it was also used if somebody um, died. So in the 1700s, there were people were having reactions to um, cooking with tinware, and it was acidic reaction. So they would find people that they thought were dead, and in England, they were digging up graves, and they found a lot of scratches on coffins, and they found that they were burying people alive. So here in the United States, in, in England, their solution was they put a little bell and there was a bell keeper in each of the cemeteries. So if you woke up and you weren't dead, you would ring the bell and they'd dig you up. But here in the States, they would bring you to the parlor, lie you out on, on the sofa for three days to see if you would wake up. So the parlor was the parlor until the last maybe 100 years. And during that time, uh, funeral homes came into vogue. So then people started being buried from funeral homes and then people started call calling the parlor the living room. This is Samuel Fitch's will, which was signed and sealed with his own blood. Now, we don't know for certain if the pine floors went down before the Revolutionary War because the King of England wanted all the pine boards over 12 inches shipped back to England. So they hid them in the attics. So we don't know if they went down prior to the Revolutionary War, but we do know they, that there still are boards up in our attic. So this room is called the keeping room. This was the original kitchen in the house. This is the room where everybody would um, sit. Remember, they had no electricity, so they would have one candle in the evening, uh, one hand dip candle, and they would sit in here and father would read his book and mom would do his, her stitchery and children would do their homework or play simple little games candle would go out, they'd all go to bed. Uh, they were farmers, they were up early in the morning and went to bed as soon as it got dark. So the beehive oven is here to the right behind the little black door and it's shaped like a beehive. So it's shaped 
with an arch top. They would put the wood in there and get it good and hot and put the wood underneath and that's where they would bake their bread, bake their cookies. All of the um, iron work is original to the fireplace um, and that is where they would actually cook their meals. The keeping room was the kitchen, so it would have had a wood table, would have had simple chairs, but this would be the room where they would sit at night and rest. Uh, the other thing that was interesting about keeping rooms is they would have a half wall, and the other side of the room was called the borning room. So in this side of the room with their one candle, the family would be on the other side if somebody was ill, a baby was being born, they would be in a little bed on the other side of the wall in the same room as the family. So the part of the house that you've seen previously was the original house built in 1711. There were five rooms. You saw the three rooms downstairs. Two bedrooms above mirrored the dining room and the parlor. When the Murphys lived here, he was a farmer for trade. So he put in five barns. He built an ice house, which he lugged ice from the field up and kept it in straw to preserve things. And he also added on a big section of this house. So this room was called the summer kitchen. And you'll see that the stove is in a little nook and it's actually in like a closet. But what's actually behind here is a um, chimney. So this room as a summer kitchen would have been opened up. The back would have been open. It would not have been enclosed as part of the house. It would not have been attached to the house. There would have been a little outside area to walk between the two. It would have had a big open pit where they canned all of their food because remember he has 264 acres. I don't think I told you that part. And he was farming a lot of the land at that time. So to preserve food, they both used the ice house and they had hired hands. So in the mid-1800s, the Murphys, who were farmers, added on a big section to the house. Again, it was for the hired hands. There were bedrooms upstairs. There were eight to ten men sleeping in two bedrooms. There was no heat. There was the summer kitchen where they canned food. This room was the woodshed. And actually, when we moved here in the 60s, I was a child, and it was a woodshed, and it was just filled with wood. My dad had actually built and put windows in and made it an extension of their kitchen. And we use it as our office right now. So this area was originally a barn. It was put on as a barn when Mr. Murphy put on the area for the hired hands. Remember, they lived with under a woodshed and they had no heat. So this was a one-story barn where animals were that helped keep the hired hands warm. When the Belangers lived here, um, they, Mr. Belanger was a salesman. So he took this one-level barn and he made it into a room. So he had parties here and he put in the fireplace. When my five brothers and I were in college, coming and going from college, my father raised the roof and put a bedroom upstairs. So now we rent it, we call it the carriage house, but it really was a barn for animals. When Mr. Powers built the house, two of his cousins lived um, in the neighborhood. One lived on Great Road around the corner and one lived a couple doors down and they came and took a lot of land from the Neshoba Indians. So when Mr. Powers built this house, he took 264 acres from um, the Native Americans, and there were attacks on the houses. His cousins moved in at the end of the 1600s, so they suffered more attacks than the Powers. On one occasion, there was a confrontation where one of the Native Americans was killed. So the um, group of Native Americans came and took a little girl named Mary Shepard. She was nine years old and they incorporated her into her family. They have a belief that you take a soul for a soul, so if someone kills a member of your family, then you take a member of their family. The other interesting thing about the attacks were when the house was built, it's a salt box colonial with a really steep, steep roof. So when the eaves of the roof, houses of this um, period had an area designated for the children to go when these attacks occurred. In some homes in town, um, they found little beds, little chairs um, in an area where the children would actually go often. But this house did not have as many attacks as the neighboring houses. The Murphys lived here during the Civil War and um, they added on the portion of the house for their hired hands in the summer kitchen. And during that period, they hid slaves and they made a tunnel that went over underneath the summer kitchen and out to the corner of the house which is where the original um, road was. 
So it was an escape route. If you go down into the tunnel, it's a crawl space. There is a wall in a closet upstairs, which my father has since put bookcases on, that was a removable wall. And it had a space just about 18 inches. Um, and they think that when somebody came to the home and people had to hide, they would actually go up into this closet, into this removable wall. But the crawl space was part of the escape route on um, the Underground Railway. The first family were the Powers, and he was a minister from the town of Chelmsford, and he's the one that had the house built. He lived here from 1711 to 1732. The uh, Fitches lived here for almost 100 years. Samuel Fitch was a yeoman, and he was a gentleman farmer. He lived here with his wife and his children. His daughter Lydia married Francis Layton, the committee man. He was kind of the head farmer during the Revolutionary War. So he used our dining room as a tavern, and the committee men from the neighboring towns would get together and talk about uh, what they were going to do when the redcoats came. Remember that these were farmers. You know, they had their muskets for shooting rabbits and quail, and they would gather and talk about what they were going to do when the redcoats came. And then the next family were the Murphys, and their family lived here for almost 100 years as well. So the Wrights were next, and they didn't live here very long. The next family is the Belangers. He was a salesman. He lived here with his four daughters. Um, one of his daughters, who was the, the young girl that was very fond of sheep and would bring them up to her bedroom for tea parties and give them baths until the well ran dry and sneak them into the smoke room for um, birthing their babies in the spring. And then the um, Caldwells bought the house with the gentleman that owned the ski area, so it was all one property. So originally this house was all farmland and all of Neshoba ski area was part of this land. And then when um, the Caldwells and the Fletchers divided up the land, the ski area took most of the land and this house just has a couple acres with it. And my parents bought it from, from Mr. Caldwell. We're really trying to Imagine what it would have been like to live here back in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, I know that the days from town wrote diaries in the mid-1800s and their life was really hard. So we're trying to reconstruct some of the time and see what it would have been like to live with no lights and no water in the house. And it's just, it's been a really fun time. We've, we're enjoying it. Happy that I've been able to experience it. Back before the days of freezers and refrigerators, people had to rely on ice to preserve their food. This ice had to be harvested from ponds, lakes, and rivers in the winter and stored in huge buildings known as ice houses. In the late 1700s, only the rich could afford ice. Then in 1808, a man named Frederick Tudor from Boston had the novel idea of cutting ice right in Massachusetts and shipping it throughout the world. His company began shipping ice as far as Europe and India. He became known as the Ice King. This business idea soon spread to the Westford area as well. Two men by the names of Daniel Gage and his partner Tom Hittinger of Belmont founded the Gage Ice Company in 1850. The Gage Ice Company would go on to control most of the ice harvesting in the greater Lowell area. It is said that Gage became known as the Ice King of Lowell. Gage's company harvested ice on the Merrimack River, Hart Pond in Chelmsford, and many other locations throughout the area. There were two ice houses in Westford. One large house at Forge Pond, and a smaller one at Burgess Pond, which supplied ice to the town of Westford. He was in the business of um, ice cutting on the ponds, both on Forge Pond, Burgess Pond, which is in East Boston Camps, and he also owned property in towns all around us, Drake at Tingsboro. The Forge Pond Ice House was five stories tall and covered about an acre. The Ice House stood on the site of the current public beach and parts of the foundation are still visible to this day. You can see, still see the foundation when you go down to the town beach. Those uh, 
cement blocks that are there. That was the old foundation of the ice house before it burned. The ice on the pond was monitored until it was approximately 14 inches thick, which was the ideal thickness for harvesting. The pond was known to freeze as deep as 3 feet, but that was too thick for harvesting. First, horses pulling iron bars would clear off the snow and slush from the top of the ice. Then they would drag plows that would make 2 inch deep cuts into the ice. The ice was then cut into floats. Finally. It was cut into small cakes and placed on a steam-powered lift and lifted into the ice house. Sawdust and straw were used to insulate the ice. Every winter, it was filled to the ceiling with ice. The ice was then shipped on the railway, which runs right by the site of the ice house. And then they would ship it by rail car to the south and as far as Europe. It just boggled my mind that Forge Village, you know, Forge Pond ice was um, cooling things in Europe. And uh, Daniel Gage had a very successful business. For a while, ice was America's second biggest crop by weight. When Daniel Gage died in 1901, this obituary was printed with a picture and an explanation of his legacy. Ironically, on the same page, the magazine featured patents for a new refrigeration technology, foreshadowing the eventual demise of the ice cutting industry. Um, he died quite young and he actually left the business to his daughter who ran it as a female entrepreneur long before there were many others. This was in the 1930s. And on her death, her will said that all of the properties that belonged to the Gage Ice Company would go to the communities in which it belonged. So that's how we got um, Tad McSwamp and Mystery Spring. That was all Gage property. It's all wetland, obviously, because they bought wet land. Um, and then there's another beautiful piece on Old Lowell Road. On the left-hand side, that's the Martina Gage Town Forest, though the sign is long gone. But that actually goes all the way down to Hart Pond. And in the 50s, there was a small beach there. So not only did Mr. Gage um, build a very successful company, but his daughter left the uh, town quite a legacy. Then, in 1918, around the end of World War I, the mechanical refrigerator was introduced, making harvested ice obsolete. And by 1930, the ice cutting industry had been completely abandoned. Many ice houses were demolished. As a result of the insulation materials used in the ice houses, they were extremely flammable and often burned down, either accidentally or on purpose. Exactly, of course, they would be highly flammable, absolutely. And I guess, you know, many months of the year they were actually empty, because um, once the ice was harvested, it, didn't, it stayed there through you know, the early summer months. But then there must have been a period of time there, probably August, uh, January, February. Today, remnants like this are all we have to remind us of the industry that melted away. One interesting thing about Westford is the fact that it is made up of several different villages. You may have wondered about how the various sections of Westford got their names. Ellen Hardy, a longtime Westford resident and local historian, explains the origins of the village names. The sections of town were Forge Village, Graniteville, Nabnasset, which was originally called Nabnasset, uh, Brookside, and Parker Village. So um, some of them, it's pretty obvious how they got their names. Um, forge Village was, in fact, where there was an iron forge. There was a smelting. Um, the iron ore came from Groton. Uh, at that point, Forge may have even been part of Groton, because we acquired that from Groton. And uh, it was the Prescott family who owned that, and it operated until the mid-1800s. So it truly was a Forge Village. Mainly, it was... Um, parts for wagons, the springs and the axles and that. So I think that it is tools as well as wagon parts. Um, so that was largely what it did. Um, Mr. Hudgman is a little disparaging. He says it really wasn't very good quality. And it's one of the reasons that it went out of business. After the smelting company, there was a Forge Village nail company. 
um, and then that went uh, defunct in the 1850s or 60s. And that's when the Abbots bought that property and built the Abbott Mill that is in Forge Village at the moment. But the name Forge Village stuck. This is an old print of uh, Graniteville. And you can see up on the hill, all of these are quarries. So they were not large quarries. They were all just individual um, sort of outcroppings of granite. Basically, they were boulders. And different families, like the Palmers, um, owned those areas and they, they um, uh, that's where Graniteville got its name from all of the granite that's up there. Fletcher granite has actually been used in many buildings and monuments throughout the United States. Some examples include Quincy Market, Harvard University, the National Gallery of Art, the Supreme Court Steps, and the Treasury Building in Washington DC. Although Graniteville is the area of town usually associated with granite, some granite can actually be found throughout the town. One example is the house and barn boulders, which can be accessed from a trail at the end of Sawmill Road. These massive granite boulders are glacial erratics, which were left here during the last ice age. These boulders are a fun spot to visit and have been climbed by Westford kids for generations. Um, the Nubanusik was an Indian name. Robert Oliphant suggests three possible translations of Nabnasset in his book, The Westford Gazetteer. They are near the dry land, pond number 12, or chestnut tree place. But that was basically a, uh, it was surrounded around the lake. And then it became a little summer village and the small cottages were there where people came out for the summer. Brookside was uh, also right near Nabnasset. Um, it's where the mill was, uh, now condominiums at the Brookside Mill in Nabnasset. And then Parker Village was named for the Parker family, who had a large farmhouse uh, just about where the Jack Walsh Field is now. Actually, it was called The Village. Um, and if you read in Mr. Um, uh, in Mr. Hodgman's book where he describes the different sections of town, he does refer to it as the village. Um, and that tended to be where, uh, well, obviously it was where the church was. The church as in bef when you wanted to become a town, and Westford didn't become a town until 1729. There were people here for almost 100 years, but we were, were part of Chelmsford. But to become a town, you had to have your own church. So the church and the town were one and the same. So that's where the church was. When they built the town hall, that's where the town hall was. So that was the municipal center. Um, and then the villages were where people lived. And there was, um, uh, there was an animosity between the people who lived on the hill, as it was called, and the people who lived on the villages because the uh, mill owners, although the mills were down in Forge and Graniteville, the mill owners, except for Mr. Sargent, but Mr. Abbott lived up on the hill. There were about five Abbott houses right around the common, but the Abbots all lived in the center. Uh, Mr. Cameron, who was Mr. Abbott's um, vice president, lived in the center. There was a sense of we and they. Um, the other thing that caused that was when the mills opened, there were not enough people living in Westford to provide the work in the mills. So the Abbots brought a lot of people to live to, to come work in Westford. And they went to Russia, to Belarus, and brought in a large number of Russians to work in the mill. Uh, Polish people came, uh, Canadians came, and uh, quite a few uh, Englishmen came, mainly because they were superb soccer players and um, Mr. Uh, Abbott had a soccer team that was a national ranking, so he would go pick out the best soccer players to come work for him. So there was also that difference in terms of the people who lived in the villages, many of them were immigrants, many of them did not speak English when they first got here. So that set up a, not a tension, but a difference in terms of those parts of Westford. And uh, even until 1973, four of those villages had their own post offices and had their own zip codes, and uh, the time that the post office consolidated those into one, it was a crisis, because the people who had been born in Forge Village, most of whose family worked in the Abbott Mill, for them, that was where they lived. They did not live in Westford, they lived in Forge Village, and to this day, 
That's very important for the people who live there, um, who have always lived there. Uh, Graniteville also has its own personality, the Healy's especially. Um, it's not as strong as it was in Forge because Forge was a larger community. So those very much kept their entity. Nebnasset was a far more uh, transient group because it tended to be a, a summer community. When people think of skiing in Westford, Neshoba Valley instantly comes to mind. Since 1964, Neshoba has been drawing in crowds of skiers every winter. However, deep within the hidden history of Westford, there lies another ski area. Opened by the McDougal family in 1956, a full eight years before Neshoba opened, this ski toe on Boston Road was a neighborhood favorite. It now lies deserted in the woods of Blakes Hill. Shirley and Steve McDougal still live on Boston Road next to the former ski hill. My name is Shirley McDougall, and we are discussing the old ski tow that used to be on Boston Road. Um, St Steve was a skier, and he had skied um, at prep school. He went to Proctor Academy in Andover, New Hampshire, where he skied on the ski team, and he just really loved skiing. And um, he used to have a ski tow for a short while at Camp Middlesex in Ashby in the late 40s and early 50s. And then they didn't run that anymore. It was too far to go every Sunday morning, I guess, or something. They decided to, to do it here on this hill, which his father owned anyway. And uh, so they, they built the little shack and they had a, um, I think it's a Ford motor, I don't know, and um, rope and put up poles and started up the ski about 1956 and we ran it for 10 years right on Boston Road on the hill where it's all woods now you wouldn't know that it was a uh, open field it had been a pasture for many many years and um, the ski hill went right up the middle and then we decided I guess Steve decided that it would be better you get a better run if it was moved over to the um, northern edge of the property. So they moved it, and the, the um, shack was up at the top of the hill, and people skied down and stopped before they went into Boston Road, hopefully. <laughs> so I understand, they skied down the hill, across Boston Road, down, what is that, Crown Road? to his back door. <laughs> it was running on Saturdays and Sundays when the conditions were good. And then Steve put lights on and they would run it on uh, in the evening. He would drive home from work in Boston, get home <laughs> about six o'clock and uh, grab a hamburger or something and run up to the Skeeto and start it up and uh, had a wonderful time. They really did. The young people in Westford all learned to ski there. The Kings Pine um, development of houses across the Boston Road was about that time and some people were delighted to have a ski tow right up the end of the street and I think it had something to do with their decision to purchase there. They sold tickets but we don't remember how much they were but I think they were about a dollar. These are the tickets. We would had different colors so that whatever color it was, that was only good for that day, and then the next day would be a different color, so. The only parking was to park on the side of Boston Road, and a lot of people just walked, walked down and skied. It wasn't, you know, Olympic size or anything, but it seems that 
everybody was there on a Sunday afternoon if the weather was good. But if you see in the pictures, you'll see, you know, maybe 20 or 30 people. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I want to thank all the volunteers who took the time to come out and help me with this project. I wouldn't have been able to do it without you guys. We had people involved in everything from research to filming to editing. So thank you. Stick around for the credits to see everyone who was involved. And finally, there are a lot more topics to cover, and unfortunately my volunteers and I can't cover them all. So, if you have any ideas for how you can continue this video series yourself, contact the Westford Historical Society to find out more. Thanks.